Scott Sullivan is joining us for our co-creative sessions number 10. Scott is a professional photographer living in Port Angeles, Washington, originally from Rhode Island. Scott grew up surfing on the East Coast, eventually making his way out West in his late teens. An artist first, Scott has a diverse background as a former professional snowboarder and an avid surfer. He finds a unique niche in the snow and surf industry where he shoots alongside and for high profile figures such as Dave Rostovich, Nicholas Mueller, Travis Rice, John John Florence, Nathan Fletcher, and many, many more professional surfers and snowboarders figureheads within the space. Scott's work has been published in multiple high profile catalogs such as Surfline, Magic Seaweed, Surfer Magazine, Surfing Magazine, RIP, Transworld Surf, Transworld Snow, also RIP. And he has also been documented by film and studio organizations such as Teton Gravity Research, Absinthe Films, Red Bull, Volcom Bands, Quicksilver, and Fuel TV. Scott, alongside his wife, Natalie, and wonderful daughters, Flora and Scarlett, travel the world doing what they love to do, surf, explore, and be merry. Prior to living in Port Angeles, Scott and his family resided in Encinitas, California, where they still own a home. In addition to his photography work, Scott is an avid musician playing his music throughout the snow and surf communities he has called home for most of his life. It is with great pleasure I introduce Scott Sullivan and welcome him to the co-creative session. Scott, let it rip. All right. So my history starts back sometime in the 80s um, when my mom gave me her camera. She was a bit of a photographer herself, more of a hobby. She had an incredible Canon AE-1 that I kind of commandeered from her and began shooting. I began shooting film. As I got into high school, I started taking photography classes, which taught me darkroom, printing, rolling my own film, how to use the camera, the principles of aperture and shutter speed, depth of field, all great things like that. My teacher thought I had a good eye for it. He encouraged me to do it. Um, and it was really kind of the one area in school that I, that I kind of did okay. And I kind of struggled with schooling uh, growing up. Like a lot of people, it didn't come easy for me, but I have kind of found a way to forge my path through life with my photography. And that's been a result of me just kind of following my heart and my passion for what I like to do. I began surfing when I was nine years old and surfing kind of set the course for me on what I'm passionate about and what I like to do. In 1983, I began snowboarding. I bought my first snowboard uh, at the watershed in Rhode Island. And I got heavily into surfing and snowboarding. Now, the thing with photography at the end of the day is to really shoot what you love, shoot what you know, and shoot what you're passionate about. Because when you're true to yourself and you're true to your, your heart and your passion like that, you're out in the world and you meet other people that follow those same passions as you do, and they see that truth. Likewise, you see it in them. That forms friendships and friendships go on for life uh, if they're nurtured. That's essentially what kind of has happened to me. I created a network of friends in surfing and snowboarding that as we grew up, my friends, they worked at the magazines, they worked at the companies. We all kind of became part of this industry and that's our network. I always say in life, you, you either make your network on Wall Street or you make it in the mountains doesn't matter where you make it, but your network is something that's going to get you through life. And that's your friend group. And as we all grow up, um, that's what's going to carry you. None of us are an island. None of us stand alone. So a lot of the stuff you're going to see coming up is me just capturing what I love of people doing what they love. That's kind of sums it up in a nutshell. This is, I'm going to start with this picture here. I'm going to run through a few pictures initially. And this is a picture of me back in 1995 on my first trip up to Alaska that was shot by Chris Murray. I rode it professionally as a snowboarder for a while. I eventually blew my knee out and I switched over to photography. These initial shots are kind of some of what I like to do. This is myself down in Uluwatu, down in Bali. This is me in the helicopter filming with the boys at Absent Films, me and my mustache out in the ocean, my happy place. Here's another shot of me riding. I used to like to jump off big cliffs all the time. 
I feel it now. I feel it in my neck. <laughs> that was kind of my thing. This is some of my really early uh, photos from Monahans in Rhode Island. I first got published when I was 16 years old. Surfer Magazine ran a, like a really small image and I got a $10 check in the mail. That, that was amazing. Um, it was, I couldn't believe I was actually getting paid for that. So there's another shot of myself. So these are just kind of reflecting what I do. There's a shot of my dad, my sister Allison, and myself um, up at Sugarbush in Maine. Um, I had parents that really encouraged the outdoor lifestyle and getting us out there to do this stuff, showing us a love for the snow, love for the beach, love for the mountains. Um, a lot of my love for all that stuff goes back to that that I got from my, from my parents. So thanks you guys for that. Here's me, uh, 1983 on my Burton back hill, first snowboard ever. My still my favorite thing to do is lay a big slash. And then a couple of years ago down in Indonesia, and that's that guy. So that's a little bit of background, essentially about me right there. I'm gonna start with some of the cover shots that I've had over the years, just to kind of give you an idea of the kind of stuff that I shoot. And I worked with Snowboarder Magazine for a long time um, as one of their senior photographers. I worked with Volcom, Quicksilver, all kinds of, all kinds of different people. Um, having an avenue through the editorial in the magazines was, was an incredible thing for me. Um, I essentially consider myself a photojournalist. Like I said, I'm out there capturing people doing what they love. Um, as a photojournalist and as a photographer, I think one of my biggest attributes is being able to put myself in those places. There's photographers that are technically a lot better than I am, but I know the subject matter and I get into the positions and the places where the riders and the surfers can go so that I can capture it. This is a shot of Gigi Roof over in Switzerland. A little bit of flash photography that I did where I had a flash planted under the house and then I shot it on a remote control and then I shot it from a couple of hundred yards away. So I've had a pretty good run with covers. Uh, I've had, I think, 30 plus covers in my career with different magazines. These are just a few of them. Um, often when I shoot, and I still shoot that way, you would shoot kind of so that they could have text in the photo the way I would compose. I always compose in the camera. So um, this was one of my favorite photos right here. This is Gigi Ruff. We're over in Switzerland. They, there wasn't a lot of great things happening. So we were up there just hanging out snacking and we were eating gummy bears. I decided to take the gummy bears and throw them up in the air while Gigi went off the jump. Um, I actually had my friend Nate Shane. He was the gummy assistant. As Gigi launched, Nate threw all the gummy bears in the air, and then Gigi came flying through, and it worked as a cover, uh, the font, everything tied into it, Gigi's colors. So that was kind of making something out of nothing, really, just thinking outside the box, what can you do to make things happen when it's time to make things happen? This is another great one of Gigi. We're up in Alaska. We traveled up to Haynes, Alaska for about 15 years with absent films, and we were able to explore and pioneer all this incredible terrain via helicopter. When you're up there, you're at the mercy of the weather, and this is a good example of that because we landed the heli on our first day. We got off the heli, and the clouds came in and the fog, and we decided that we couldn't even ride down the mountain because it was too foggy and the heli wouldn't be able to pick us up. So Gigi built something right where the helicopter dropped us off and he started doing hand plants on it. Sure enough, it landed up as a cover <laughs> in Japan. So you never know what you're gonna get with things like that. This here is my very first cover. I shot this on film on the AE-1 that I got from my mom. I shot all winter long. Um, at the end of the year, I compiled 100 slides and I sent them to the editor at Snowboarder Magazine. I didn't think much of it. And next year, the photo annual pops up, which is the cream of the crop uh, issue for the best photos of the year. And I got to cover the photo annual. So it was a pretty good sign to keep doing what I was doing. So at that point, um, I'd been working as a waiter up at Snowbird. 
And I remember going to work at 4.30 after riding, staring out the window, and there was two feet of fresh powder outside. And I was looking out at the light and everything. And I said, I should be out there right now shooting. I can't do this job if I want to be a photographer. So that day I gave my two weeks notice. And from that point on, I never looked back. Um, and this was one of the images that came out of that commitment. They had a question about your covers. I was just wondering when you're shooting for a cover, are you out on a job shooting for a cover or does it end up being a cover in a photo that you've taken? I think you're always shooting for a cover. Yeah. No matter exactly. what you're doing. I got in the mode of shooting two page spreads and covers. They pay more than anything. Um, if you look at this cover here, you can see I shoot with the subject down here on the right, but I left that space up top in the snow. There's a cornice over my head where they can put the font. So I, I would often try to shoot like that. You can't buy covers. So when we're working with a company for a photo shoot, um, you just hope that you're going to get something like that. That's, that's, that would be an incredible achievement from a photo shoot to land the cover for a company. They would love that uh, and it would be a bonus. So um, I had pretty good luck doing that. Uh, I'm grateful for that. I just would always shoot that, shoot for that. No, no sense in shooting for a little spot photo or a half page. So I just always went for the big double spreads, uh, which was a horizontal shot with a big, with the gutter and pages in the middle and then the covers. I love boards, the surfboards, the snowboards, the skateboards. Um, I shoot them like they're people. I often take portraits of boards. Uh, this is one that I dreamed up. Uh, this is just in my yard in Washington, and I set up uh, kind of a little bit of a family tree of some old snowboards with a lineage of some historical surfboards as well. And I just kind of let it snow that night on it and got some pretty nice images out of that one. This is Brandon Ruff up in Alaska. If you look, you can see his tracks coming down from the peak. And then one big long went out the bottom where he pointed at high speed and walking away. When you're up in Alaska, it is gut-wrenching quite often. You get dropped by helicopter on top of those peaks. Most of the times can't see the bottom because it's so steep that it rolls over and you have to go on memory. Or in the old days, we used to have a Polaroid camera that we'd bring with us to shoot. These days, kind of easy to have a phone, but still once you're on, you got to remember exactly where to go. Every time you get down, you have a huge sigh of relief and adrenaline flowing through you. This is actually Brandon with the guide looking at that line previously. This is a big face called Stormtrooper up in Haynes, Alaska. One of the heavier lines up there, heavier zones. That's a lot of different lines. This is another one. This is Travis Rice and Nicholas Mueller. They're about to ride a zone called Dirty Needle. There's a story about this that they went and did one run and. Travis hiked up over here. Can you guys see my cursor on here? Okay, so this big cornice up here, Travis kind of came over here one time uh, and then got under here to ride this line. And then he went back the second time and he was under this and this whole cornice broke. And all of a sudden we saw this 100 foot cloud going down this gully. And Travis got flushed about 2000 vertical feet and buried at the bottom. Uh, we flew in with the helicopter. We saw his arms sticking out and he had cleared his face. His board was broken in half, still attached to his feet. Um, it was pretty harrowing experience, but Travis is no stranger to harrowing experiences, but we, it's a situation where a lot of, most people probably would have died, uh, but Travis uh, has the mental composure to keep it all together and survive those situations. This is Gigi Roof down in New Zealand, Mount Cook. We we're on a Vulcan photo shoot. I'm roped in with a harness. The guide's holding on to me and I climb down into these ice crevasses to get this shot. I realize now, especially having kids, uh, the situations that I used to put myself in just to get the shot were pretty far out, dangerous, under, under cornices, under exposed slopes but I had a lot of faith in the universe <laughs> and everything worked out. I don't know if I'd be doing so much of that now. I think a lot more about kind of when I'm getting myself into dangerous situations and about my girls. So yeah, but I have some great photos from moments like that and that's one of them. This is a trip down to Japan with Nicholas Mueller. Uh, for two weeks, we rode around Japan. We were in Sapporo on the North Island and there was about eight feet of snow downtown. So we just took to climbing the buildings and snowboarding off of anything we could. 
we were cruising with Elmo. Somehow Elmo ended up in our van on the first night of our trip. We went out on a big party night out in Tokyo. And uh, next day Elmo was with us and he stayed with us the rest of the trip. He's jumping off the roof with Nicholas right there. Uh, and that was one of many lines that Elmo was able to take with us. Uh, there he is shooting through the Bolex 16 millimeter film. Uh, when we worked with Absent Films, we were always shooting film movie cameras. Uh, this is a shot of my buddy, Mike Basich. This is essentially a collaborative effort between myself and Mike. Mike knew the location of these weather towers outside of Utah and he asked me to come up there and shoot it. Uh, Mike himself is an incredible photographer and he often will shoot things himself, but when in doubt, like you'll see a couple of my later shots, um, he'll kind of have me there for backup. Uh, but this is one of the ones I went with him and it was a great team effort and one of my favorite shots still. This is a shot of Justin Hostinek up at Mount Hood with J.P. Solberg filming for Transcendence by Absinthe Films. This is Austin Hironaka up at Snoqualmie Pass. This is uh, Kendra Starr, this incredible woman that I used to shoot with up at Mount Baker on one of the perfect, beautiful Mount Baker Northwest powder days. This is Humpus Moseson from the Robot Food Crew out in Smiley Creek, Idaho. It's another one of my favorite shots. This is a really good friend of mine, Wolfgang Nivelt. We call him Bole. I spent a month over it with him in his home in Austria, with him and the Aesthetic Crew, back around 2003. Uh, we got an amazing amount of good stuff. This shot's not staged. It's just a bunch of tourist skiers stopping to watch the circus that we had going on. Uh, he's gapping from taking off here and he's landing down on this other side. This is also Bole uh, riding a dam that we did some sessions on. He's getting sparks coming off of his board there. Uh, low light. Slower shutter speed. Helicopter in Alaska. This is from a very famous snowboarding session. It was kind of a shot heard around the world thing. It was called Chad's Gap out in Utah. Um, There's a skier, Chad Zarinskis, that I actually used to work with at the Lodge Club in Utah. He was a prep cook there, but he was also a badass skier. He came up with this jump. He built this jump to go over the road. These are, this is an old mine shaft in Utah in a little Cottonwood Canyon. And he built this jump, which essentially you go from here to here. I think it's 115 feet. Um, some skiers had hit it for a few years and no snowboarders had ever hit it. Uh, we built this jump for four days with the Absinthe Films crew. And Travis Rice and Roman DeMarquis, seen here, were the ones to hit it. Um, it truly rang out around the world. Um, it was a monumental moment in progression of snowboarding, and I'm very lucky to be there to witness it. This is Nicholas Mueller up in Alaska, trying his luck, sneaking in on a cornice like that and hoping it doesn't break, but he's very light-footed, like a lot of the great snowboarders, and it's one of the secrets to being safe and getting in and getting out, being light on your feet. Something they would do in the magazines is they would, we would shoot sequences. So they would compile our sequences into what we call a morph and to show the whole progress of the line. This is a uh, volley, knee belt again, up in Alaska, jumping over a uh, small avalanche slough that he broke off. This is Travis Rice again, uh, when we were shooting the Art of Flight. And if you look in the landing, you see a rock in there. Travis hit it first time, landed on the rock and went right back up and did it again and stomped it clean. Uh, the shot is in the film. And one of my favorite shots from that shoot that we did. This is uh, Mike Bassage, one of my first photos ever published up at Snowbird. Jake Blauvelt, as you can see, I'm under the cornice again here. Uh, this is one of these sketchy things that I realized I used to do. But once again, I was shooting for a cover. Like we talked about, I'm leaving that room up top there, room down the side for text uh, with a nice action imagery in the back. This ended up running as another cover, that's BJ Linus out in Alaska. We have Roman DeMarquis down on the bottom and Chris Ward, the surfer up on the top. 
the Roman shot below. It was just aiming for something like this. You never know if it's going to work out if you are going to manage to pull off a shot like that to get them to block out the sun. But that one worked out. I spent a lot of years riding at Snowbird in Utah, I think 10 years, uh, riding over 100 days a year and working there at night. My life and all my friends and community in snowboarding basically came out of there. Um, there were some incredible pros living there. Great, great mountain. We came up at a really vibrant time in snowboarding through the 90s when a lot of things were happening and we were really a strong tribe. Mikey was just one of us. Another guy in there was MCA from the Beastie Boys, Andy Hetzel, all kinds of like amazing people frequented Snowbird. So this is one down uh, by Tower 3 off the tram. The tram is one of the incredible things about Snowbird. You go 3,700 feet up the mountain in seven minutes, and then you try to race it down and get back on the next one. Uh, here's Travis Rice at Super Park out in Colorado. Shooting park jumps can get kind of boring sometimes. You're always kind of looking for new angles. Um, this was an angle shot from over on the chairlift tower on the next run over. And there was this brief moment where the rider would pop through the sky and then disappear again. I was inspired by my buddy, Jeff Baker. who used to be the photo editor at Snowboarder to get this one and to always keep pushing and looking for new angles. This is the view down one of those runs. This is my board. Uh, looking down what we have to ride after we shoot, or shall I say what we get to ride after we shoot. Um, the riders will kind of go down and hit all these pillows and it'll leave us photographers up there at the top. Uh, and all we gotta do is let it rip. Um, this photo is pretty special to me because you can see the KP on the board. And KP was, is Kevin Pierce. Kevin Pierce was on his way to becoming a top level Olympian and he sustained a massive head injury in a half pipe accident over in Park City, uh, suffered severe brain damage, um, and it essentially ended his career. He's still with us and he has recovered quite well. Um, but for a lot of years, it was a real struggle. There's a movie called The Crash Reel and I'll kind of give you the whole story about that. Sometimes it's just nice to take the spirit of your friends to those places when they can't be there. So I was about to let it rip down this slope, about 3,000 vertical feet to go. And those are the rewards of being a snowboard photographer. Scott, we have a question from someone in the audience. How did you meet such experienced writers and pros? Um, then there's a couple more. Do you recommend reaching out to local pros via, via social media and ask to shoot them writing? or go with them in the back country? How did you establish connections early on in your career? Kind of like what I mentioned before, um, I established my connections through loving snowboarding. I was a very passionate snowboarder. Snowboarding was at a different point at that time. Really when I started, if you saw another snowboarder on the hill, you instantly became friends. Um, as snowboarding grew, that tribe actually grew. And so everybody kind of knew each other. Um, but regardless, even today, if you're riding a local mountain and you're a regular there, you'll see the same people. Um, everybody kind of gets to know each other. And we just want to surround ourselves with people that are into the same stuff as us, right? That love what we love, like we like to talk about, do what we want to do, help push us to do better. So when you're riding with those people and stoked on that, or even just and you don't have to be riding as good, but you know, you, you admire it and you want to capture it. The best thing you can do is just, you know, say, Hey, do you want to go shoot some photos sometime? Mm -hmm. And almost everybody loves having photos taken of themselves. Right. <laughs> uh, so when somebody's willing to be on the other side of the camera and take those photos, people are usually pretty willing to do that. Like I said, it's about just being true to what you're doing. And don't be fake because people that are really passionate about the stuff, they can see right through that fakeness. So just go after what you want and what you believe in and don't stop. Just keep going. It will take a long time sometimes, but you're doing what you love. So it's going to be fun the whole time, right? And eventually you'll make the connections to shoot. In this day and age, even with social media, 
reaching out to people. If you're not meeting them face-to-face, -face, that's one possible way to do it. Top level riders are, they can be busy or they're usually shooting a lot of stuff anyways, but I recommend just shooting with your friends and getting your stuff out there. The more you shoot, the better you get. Shoot, shoot, shoot. And then the people, your, your subjects, they'll, they'll fall into place. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question. When did you switch from film to digital? I held out for a little while. Uh, my first, I really probably switched in 2007 and I bought the Canon 20D. There was no, you know, for a while I shot, I shot both. Um, before that, I primarily shot slide film. Um, I still have probably 100,000 slides and binders up at my house. I was resistant initially, uh, like I am with a lot of things until I get into it, <laughs> then I get really into it. I think I rolled both cameras for a while, film and digital, and then eventually they got so good. One of the things with the early digital cameras is they, they altered your lenses so that uh, they cropped them. So if you were shooting, say, a 20 millimeter wide angle lens, it would alter how the lens looks. And I love using my lenses for what they are and for what they're supposed to do. Um, so when Canon started coming out with like the 5D first camera that I got, it's called a full frame sensor. And that allowed me to really use all my lenses um, for what they are. Um, I've been on that camera ever since the 5D. I'm on the 5D Mark IV now. I love shooting digitally. It, there's a lot of pluses, but there's pluses to shooting film too. When you're shooting film, you think about things more. You compose in advance. You only have 36 shots on a roll, so you're not just firing away. You got to really think about stuff. And I still recommend people that really want to get into photography should shoot film. They should get a film camera. They should learn how to use shutter speed and aperture and film speed and all those things and shoot black and white, shoot color, shoot different films. It's fun. Um, one of the beautiful things about it is you don't get to see it. You have to wait until it comes back from the lab. And sometimes that's a couple of days, sometimes that's a couple of months. But I'll tell you when, you, when it comes back, you've removed yourself enough from the moment that it is fresh and exciting. Um, there's a lot of times and you can tell the action level that I shoot is really high. So the emotion is really, is, is really powerful. And I'll look at the screen after I shoot and I'm just like, this shot sucks. And I just, or I won't, I won't feel it. I'll have to be like six months later, I'll look at it again. I'll be like, oh my God, that shot's amazing. Is there a part of the world you really love to shoot? I love Alaska. Um, Alaska was really good to me. Um, the terrain and the light. Uh, Mother Nature is the boss, without a doubt. Um, all your senses are at 110% you're paying attention to the danger, to the action, to the weather, um, to the radio, to the helicopters coming in, to the snow conditions, everything. Um, you're, you're just alive. You're so energized. And when everything comes together in Alaska, um, it is just so grand and so incredible. And Mother Nature just puts on such a show. Um, and for me, when Mother Nature is putting on that show and these guys, take their skills and put it on that canvas that mother nature has provided. That is, that's the best of the best. Um, I call that the third paradise. First paradise is, is nature. Second paradise is things created by man. And third paradise is when the two combine to create something bigger. For surf, I really, really love shooting in Hawaii. I shoot on the North shore of Oahu. Um, it's been shot to death for, 30 or 40 years, and I, there's always something new to capture there. Uh, the light changes all day long, lighting up different places. Um, the talent is there. The best surfers in the world are there. One thing when you're shooting surfing, uh, you have to be very sensitive to, to giving away secret spots or people's private breaks, you know, not private breaks, people's breaks, uh, and respect the locals. Uh, and in Hawaii, you can shoot the world's best in some of the massive biggest surf. So I'll go into some of my surf photos that I like. This is my daughter, Flora. She's become quite an incredible longboarder. She is obsessed with surfing like I was. 
her style and grace um, is really inspiring to me. And she's also opened up my eyes to the beauty of longboarding and I'm looking forward to a lot of great years sh shooting with her. Here we go in Hawaii. This is John John Florence. This is at Pipeline this past winter. Um, shooting water at Pipeline has been something that I have been slowly chipping away at and worked up the nerve eventually to get out there. And now I'm able to be out there in some pretty big conditions. Um, and I love it. You'll be out in the water for four hours shooting. This is Waimea Shore Break. When I shot this in 2016, and I don't think it had been done something like this since 2009, uh, from what one of my buddies had told me. But this is an interesting spot because the light comes up first thing in the morning. It shoots right down the Waimea Valley. You have about 45 minutes of light where the light is hitting directly across the wave face. And as it goes on through the day, the light goes up here and you lose this front lit, beautiful aspect of it. It's incredibly powerful. It breaks about 30 feet off the beach with all the rage and power while the outside is three or four times overhead. Here's a little shot of my friend Cassie Dunaway. I shot out down in San Diego, used it for the back of one of my album covers. This is Derek Hind. He is one of the great visionary voices in surfing. Lost his eye back in the 80s in a surfing accident during a contest heat where the fin came up and hit him in the eye, knocked his eyeball out. Um, as the legend goes, he paddled out, back out to finish the heat, and went up to his competitor with his eye dangling out and freaked him out, <laughs> obviously. And I think he even won the heat. Uh, he now has a glass eye um, and it hasn't stopped him from doing anything. Uh, he's a, always a pioneer. This is a, God, what's the guy's name? John something or other. Uh, he's a big rock local down in La Jolla. Rasta man, he's got dreads down to his back of his knees. Uh, and I just love the shot. Just, I had a water droplet on the lens and it made a rainbow and seemed to go perfectly with his whole vibe. This is Miguel Tudela during the pipeline, uh, the Volcom Pipeline Pro. This is an inside wave that kind of missed the reef and then broke really close to shore in the foam zone. It's very snowboardy to me, very powerful. It was a quick flash moment as it happened. I didn't even realize what was there until afterwards. But I like this. I like it as a black and white. Uh, this is pipeline from the water. Um, like I said, pipeline's been shot for four, like forever and ever. Uh, it's been shot by so many photographers, but every single wave comes in has the potential to have a new face and look different. Uh, they're like snowflakes. No two waves are the same. And I don't think I'd ever get tired of shooting them. Uh, this is Ayala Stewart, very kind hearted warm, soft-spoken Hawaiian uh, who lets his surfing do the talking. Very classic style. I flew over to Hawaii for my birthday this year and shot this on my birthday. One of my favorite images from the winter. My bucket list this year was to go to Jaws over in Maui to catch one of the big swells. And as it turned out, uh, it was one of the biggest swells in over a decade. It was so big that nobody could even paddle into it. They had to tow, which these, these days the guys re really like to paddle. In the morning, we had just kind of showed up. This is the first big set that we saw come through. So as you can see, the wave's probably about 70 feet tall. We're off in the channel on a boat. It's so unreal, even being there in person, that just you look at it and you can hardly tell what you're looking at because it's just, it's so perfect. But to, to fathom how big and powerful that is, even in person, it's just like nearly impossible. Nathan Florence uh, on a smaller wave over at Jaws on a different day. He's paddling into this one. It's just raw power. There's Nathan Florence on a tow-in wave. Nathan is John John's brother. Um, John's been the world champion and on the competitive circuit. And Nathan is a free surfer traveling the world, surfing the biggest and gnarliest waves that he can. Um, they have an incredible family. Uh, their brother, brother Ivan, as well, is a fantastic surfer, as well as their mom. Uh, they all grew up right at Pipeline on the North Shore. This is Kai Lenny. He can ride any kind of watercraft there is. 
from windsurfer to kiteboard to foil to surfboard. He surfs everything. I think he's an alien. Um, he definitely surfs like one. One of the ones that's really taking kind of uh, radical, progressive freestyle surfing to these giant, giant waves. This is Billy Kemper. Billy Kemper is the king of Jaws. Uh, they've had a contest there for the last several years and Billy has, I forget how many of them that he's won. Um, he's a very incredibly dedicated, hardworking surfer. There's an incredible documentary about him from last year. I recommend you guys go watch it on World Surf League. It's just called Billy. Um, last year, he was on a trip in Morocco and he broke his pelvis and was pinned to the bottom and pretty much about died. They pulled him out. He was stuck in a third world hospital, um, drowning in the liquid in his lungs um, in a hospital bed away from everybody. Body just completely shattered and broken. And he, the show Billy documents his recovery. And within eight months of him recovering from that near death injury and recovery, he was back out surfing Jaws again. I can't, um, I can't tell you enough how impressed I am by this guy and how much I looked up to him. He's one of the toughest dudes on the planet and he is not afraid to shed a tear or be openly emotional in his interviews. He just is a very warm human whenever I've met him. Um, and he is just a pure hell man in the surf. This is Kai Lenny. Again, uh, this wave is up for one of the Red Bull uh, waves of the winter uh, for the big wave awards. Um, the winds were blowing about 35 knots this day, which is why another reason why people couldn't paddle into it because you can't even get down the face and you can really see the wind just tearing right into that. Uh, I'm gonna switch off that now. We got Ballarum Stack, East Coast Pride from, uh, from Long Island. I spend a lot of time at Ballarum when I'm out in Hawaii. Uh, he's on the Vulcan crew and he is dedicated to becoming proficient at pipeline. This is my daughter, Flora. This is Kelsey Waters. I went out for probably about a half hour. Just had my camera out here. Uh, she was out longboarding and I just got this picture, which I really love. It just shows the grace and the poise that the longboarders have. Um, I actually almost really prefer women longboarders. Um, I think they're, they're really, their style really complements uh, the wave and the discipline of longboarding. And this kind of captures that right there. It's a dance. It's a, a bit of a ballet. This is John John Florence. Little fun session at Rocky Point. Draws amazing power out of situations that would have most of us trying to find any kind of speed. Scott, question coming through the pipeline. Uh, if you can talk about the equipment involved in a session uh, shooting from the water and battling the, the elements. Putting your camera in the ocean, it's a whole new set of things that you got to work out. Uh, salt water will absolutely kill your camera. Um, your camera, I've lost cameras, I've lost lenses. Um, I think anybody that really does it, uh, that happens to at some point, but at the end of the day, a camera is a tool. So that just kind of comes with the territory. I shoot with Aquatech water housings. Um, I've tried various housings over the years, a lot of handmade housings through different people. Aquatech is making some great housings now with interchangeable ports, allowing you to change out your equipment really easily. Their, their controls on the back of the housing are fantastic. So you can control a lot of what you wanna do with your camera, whether you wanna shoot in video, whether you wanna review your stuff. So the first thing is really getting your, your water housing situation dialed. And I've been pretty happy with the Aquatech ones the last few years. Um, and the other thing, is then you go to getting in the water. Um, of course, you need a pair of really uh, of good flippers. And if you're gonna be shooting surfers up close, it's a really good idea to wear a helmet because if you're getting close to the surfers, the last thing you want is to get a board into your head or a fin into your head. Uh, it would, could knock you out. You could drown and die quite easily. Um, you could also hit the bottom at some of these spots like pipeline uh, and hit the reef. So it's 
good idea to be prepared with that. And then aside from that, you owe it to yourself to be in really good shape to go out there and swim around in the water and fight the currents. And um, sometimes the biggest challenge of all is getting out to the spot where the waves are even breaking because um, there'll be so much white water and waves closing out that sometimes you can't even get through the white water to get out there. Um, so perseverance is one uh, and patience. And then once you're out there shooting, um, you're swimming around quite a bit trying to be in position um, trying to keep water droplets off of your off of your camera lens, quite a few variables. Uh, currents are pulling you this way and that way. The surfer's going over here. Um, a lot of it, uh, the ratio for me is not as high uh, of success as when I'm on land. Um, a lot of those variables will sometimes get in the way, but when I do get the shots, um, they're really worth it. Um, if I, sometimes I tell myself, if I go out and get one shot in a day, then I'm happy. Um, on the good days, you end up getting more. Some days you get none. Um, but I spend time going to the swimming pool and getting in shape, um, stretching, um, just trying to be um, prepared for those situations, especially when I go over to Hawaii in the winter. Um, it's a whole different ball game. It's different than shooting stuff uh, on the East Coast or on the mainland, um, where it can be a lot more playful. Hawaii is the real deal, um, and you can get in a lot of trouble pretty quick. So the best thing to do is to uh, know your limits. Of and this kind of goes for like everything that I shoot. It's like know your limits of you know, and what your boundaries are and where you feel comfortable. And if you get in a in a tough situation, are you going to be able to handle it? Um, you know, like lose the ego. Don't worry about, you know, trying to live up to expectations or this or that. Just set out and do your do your thing. And and if you got to say no, you can't go, then don't do it. Um, no shot is ever worth injuring yourself or worse. So, um, you know, maybe you're, maybe a four foot wave is your limit and that's great. You know, stick there, have fun with it. Uh, make it work for you. And maybe a 30 foot wave is your limit. Um, it can go anywhere in between. There's neither shame nor glory going either way, whether, whether it's small or big. Hey, we're all in this to have fun and capture what we love doing. Um, you know, shooting water for me, I remember, I have a very clear image when I was 12 years old. I was surfing down in Narragansett Beach and I was watching the wave go by and had this beautiful golden light on it at sunset and it broke. And I just was like, man, I wish I could capture that in my brain somehow and just like have a picture and take it back to show my mom. And I wanted to show my mom because you know she had been into the photography as well. Um, and years later, it's kind of what I get to do. Uh, so it's been a long road getting there. And I still at this point, I absolutely love to do it. Um, it's where I'm still pushing myself in photography is, is capturing water images. It's very challenging, but very, very fulfilling. I like working with uh, slow shutters. Sometimes this is shot at 1 30th of a second. Um, and I just try to pan with the surfer and shoot and let the motion blur happen. Um, it can be quite tricky. Once again, when it works out, it's uh, it's the results are really unique. Um, here's a couple of different ones of him. It can also help to turn like a mediocre session into something really, uh, really unique and interesting by messing with your shutter speeds, which is once again, I go back to saying, hey, if you're gonna shoot pictures, don't put it on auto until you know how to use your aperture and your shutter speeds and use your camera. It's basic, basic stuff. It's, how, it's like using a tool. It's like you wouldn't go use, um, you know, a circular saw or some, you know, deadly tools without learning how to use them first. The camera's not deadly, but you do got to learn how to use your tools. Um, 
I really can't stress that enough. Learn your cameras and then occasionally, then you can go shoot on auto after that, but learn your stuff first. Scott, we got another question coming at you. Um, also, did you have a breakthrough moment where you felt like your career was taking off? Uh, that goes back to the cover of the photo annual that I had, that shot of Mike Bassich on Snowboarder Magazine was when I really felt like I could do this. And then I knew a filmmaker, Justin Hostinek, and Justin asked me to join his crew with Absinthe Films, um, which was, to me, the premier snowboarding film company around shooting the best riders in the world, European and like international, European American. That's who Travis and Nicholas and those guys all film with. Uh, so when he brought me on board, I kind of really knew that was kind of the takeoff point. Um, and that was when things really started happening. Uh, this is from a big day at Pipeline. This was the Valentine's Swell in February. Uh, I'd been running around all day shooting a bunch of places. Pipeline was rowdy and out of control all day long. And I got down at the end of the day and managed to get a couple shots right as the sun dropped on this day. This is Mason Ho from this winter water shot. Uh, one of my favorite ones from there on a real meaty one. Um, I'd been with him just a few minutes before on the beach talking. So we had linked up and went out there and I managed to get the shot. And I think two waves later, he said he sustained the worst wipe out of his life at Pipeline. He went to take off on a wave and somebody was underneath him and he had to dive off and went over the falls and broke his board. Um, this is right before that happened. This ran on Surfline uh, for that swell story for the Valentine swell. This is the third Florence brother, Ivan, incredible skateboarder, but a fantastic surfer in his own right. Um, brother to John John and Nathan. Um, Paisel Surfboards has used this shot this year. Um, really stoked about that. Um, once again, you wouldn't know that there's 75 to 100 people out. Uh, Looks like he's got it all to himself. One of my favorite shots from the winter. This is Ballaroom Stack again from New York. Puts in his time out in Hawaii. Stays right in the Volcom House, right there in front of Pipeline. And he is committed to, I'm not going to say mastering the wave, because I don't think anybody will ever master the wave. But really being able to put himself in positions like this, just style and relaxed. There's real subtleties. You know, every wave, like I said, is different, but the surfers are all different too, and they all have their own different styles. This is a beautiful pipe wave again. One of the things with pipe too, the waves are different, but the light changes all day long. In the morning, it comes up from the front and it front lights it. Midday, it gets up above and that changes the light. Get, things get a lot more blue and harsh. And then by evening, the light shifts to behind it. So you get the back of the wave becomes lit up. Um, has many, many faces, and I could probably just go there and shoot that place for the rest of my life and be happy. This is an outer reef on the North Shore. Uh, There's some beautiful light there. I, I bumped it a little bit uh, with the colors. I tend to leave my stuff as natural as can. I compose and I expose in my camera. Um, I don't like to spend a lot of time in Photoshop. Uh, I use Lightroom, and I do basic toning stuff. Occasionally, I'll mess around with some different filters. Um, this is a collection of very historical and beautiful surfboards uh, that I shot down in Indonesia. Terry Fitzgerald, Alby Thousand, uh, different shapers, different colors. These boards are full of soul. This is one of them. We're overlooking Uluwatu here. That's about a 300 foot cliff that we're on right there. This is a wave that's about six inches tall. Um, waves don't always have to be big. Sometimes the beauty is in the really small ones. Here's Waimea. Everybody caught inside a little bit, like scratching to get past this one. Kelly Slater in the middle with a couple of his friends. Waimea. This is a shot of mine that if photos were songs, this would be one of my greatest hits. Um, I shot this photo on film. Um, with my buddy Andrew Kidman back in 2000, probably. We used to go out all the time. We used to surf this place Stone Steps on a daily basis. Um, and we were out there one day. He was just goofing around 
watch it is bored into the air. The picture goes kind of beyond the story. And it's one of those pictures to me that transcends an actual board just being there. It kind of, you could use it in stock photography and it could speak transcendence and levitation and oneness and all, all kinds of great worldly things. And uh, it's resonated with people throughout, you know, and outside of the surf community, for sure. Um, it got used as a book cover. I'll show you later for a book called West of Jesus. More boards from that series. That one in the foreground is from 1923 from Atlantic City, New Jersey. It's wrapped in like some kind of canvas. Uh, that one was unearthed a few years back, quite a relic. When did you start to develop yourself, your brand for the business side of photography, pricing, copyrights, and licensing? And how did you start to prospect new clients and new opportunities? To be honest with you, a lot of that just came with the territory of where I was shooting and who I was shooting. You know, coming up in snowboarding and surfing, you're just with the people. And like I said, who your network is and where you make your network, those were my clients. Um, I primarily started shooting editorial for the magazines. And with that, people more or less uh, came to me for the photos. Um, I would do submissions to companies. You know, back then it was slides, a lot of it. So I was doing slide edits and then sending out my originals to these companies. Uh, and then they would pick and choose what they would want. I got familiar with the rates that the other photographers were charging. You know, we tried to kind of present a unified front with that. It becomes more difficult these days because a lot of people don't want to pay very much for photos. But at the end of the day, it's important to not undersell yourself and not undercut everybody else because it keeps the, the value of the photos there. So I'll do day shoots um, where people will hire you for every, everything that they shoot, you shoot during the day, they'll get to use and they'll pay you a flat rate up front. Or you can work with people where you feed them individual shots on a freelance basis. So my clientele came from spending time with people and just essentially proving myself through my photography to be capable of working with the riders and working with the companies those relationships turned into that so i've never really been one to go out and hunt down stuff too much i've been pretty fortunate in that sense to um just shoot what i'm passionate about and get it plugged in um that being said there used to be a lot more magazines around uh magazines are hard to come by these days and that was a big thing that i really enjoyed doing as far as Instagram goes, I resisted Instagram for quite a while too, because I really kind of had a hard time with people looking at your photos on a two inch screen instead of in a bigger format, but that's the way that things have gone. Um, and I enjoy that too. It just sets a new set of challenges to pick images that are going to resonate through a device. The dedication to the culture is kind of what got me my clients in the first place. And I've tried to maintain that and nurture that to this day. This body surfing picture down in Indonesia, swimming back out, just feeling the energy of the swells, um, shooting underwater with a fisheye lens, uh, trying to capture that, looks like a big eyeball to me with the surface passing by. Uh, you need to be somewhere where the water is quite clear to do that, Indonesia offers that. I like doing star shots. You can point the camera at the North Star and drop down your aperture and set your camera up for anywhere from 15 minutes to a couple hours and kind of see what you end up with. The key is to be pointing it at the hole so you get the concentric circles. There's different ways to shoot, you know, and a lot of the stuff I shoot is very of the moment. Um, and capturing, like I said, in a photojournalistic sense of what's going on and what's happening. But the more longer I've been into photography, the more I try to come up with cool projects or pre like pre-think my shots and then try to create those shots and make them happen. Um, and that can go for anything from, from a setting with a subject that you want to use in there. You maybe want to bring some props. Um, you want to use certain light, but to try to compose the vision in your head first and then go after it. I'm just gonna show you guys a few things from a long-term project that I've been working on, and I'll end it on here. When my second daughter was born, Scarlett, uh, I did these shots of her 
in mama's belly under this cherry tree that we have at our house. The shots came out beautiful and I decided that I would continue shooting those photos of them under the cherry tree every year. For 12 years now I've shot every year we go out when this tree blooms and I shoot under the tree and it's still a work in progress. I don't know how long I'm going to take it. I don't know if I'll take it 20 years. My girls are my inspiration, my family, my wife, Natalie, and my two daughters, Flora and Scarlett. At this point, everything I do with my motivation is for them. Um, it's to show them a path through life. It's to show them that if you work hard at things, that you can achieve anything. And if you follow your path and you stick to it and you stay true to your heart, that you can achieve anything. No matter how great it is or how much money somebody's making or how famous somebody gets or how talented somebody is at something, I always say somebody has to be that person, so it might as well be you. People love to tell you that you can't dream and that you can't go after your goals. There's a lot of people in, in life that will try to knock you for doing that, but you, you just don't do it. You're, you're here to live your life for yourself, and at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, and we're all on our deathbeds, you're going to be there with yourself and you're going to have yourself to answer to. And your life that you live is going to be your story. So you set your own path, find a way to make it work, make friends in the same field and in, in the same passion and surround yourself with the people that support you, challenge you, push you and love you. Once again, everything I do at this point is to show my children this path through life. I maybe selfishly did my own thing, like I've said, for years and years. And when I had them, I realized I never, I never knew love like I knew when they were, that I, like I found when they were born. So it really lit a fire under my ass. These days, I also own a pizza place. Uh, it's called The Straight Slice here in Washington. Um, it's another one of my projects I do. I do lots of things. I have a band that I play in. I'm really passionate about music. One of the slogans that I live by is make it happen. So this is some scenes from the project that I've been working on. Nobody's ever seen these before. Um, and this is just really to kind of show you a way possibilities of projects and ideas and photos don't have to be just a one thing, they can tell a whole story. So, you know, even though this is a project, this still is photojournalism for me. I just want to say thanks to you guys that stuck around and I hope you enjoyed some of the stories. I appreciate you being here to see what journey I've been on for, for all these years that my, where my camera has taken me. It's a great thing. You know, photography is such a huge thing for people these days. Uh, everybody has a camera with them all the time. So we're seeing some really, really amazing images, but the world is full of beauty and magic and coincidence and, as a photographer, the number one rule that I think is always have a camera with you and then you can capture those, that bit of magic. Well, Scott, can, is there a spot where people can check out your photos if they want to take a look? Uh, the Absent Films website, you can check out any of their films. Uh, my stuff is in there. I have some stuff on Instagram for sure. Um, I'm not the most active person uh, publishing stuff in there, but I do have a lot of my work on there that I've done and I do back it up with stories because every photo has a story behind it for me. I'd say that's probably the best avenue right now to, to check stuff off would just be through the Instagram. Well, we will definitely be having Scott on again. Um, again, thanks to Co-Creative Center, the funders, TBI and the Bar Foundation, and especially a big thanks to Scott Sullivan for making this happen and coming on board tonight. Thanks you guys for having me. You guys got a great thing going on and it's great for you to be supporting the arts. It's very important these days. In the digital era, a lot of art is taken for granted whether it's music or photography or paintings or lots of things in the art world. So when there's people that still believe in it and the power of it, it's very, very important to, to get that out there and support the people that love it. We're, we're all a community. Thank you, Scott. That was super dynamic and I look forward to catching up with you and your work in the future. <laughs>